Shall we begin our evening worship together by singing hymn number 10? Uh, forgive me, a warm welcome to everybody who is here. And may God be amongst us and those who are listening on live stream. May they too take part in heart as we come together and worship God. So shall we sing together hymn number 10, Now Thank We All Our God. This evening is found in John's Gospel, John's Gospel and chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 35. John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 35. As an introduction, God willing, we are going to be looking at the life of Peter, an incredible character, and God willing, we shall have an overall view of him this evening, and God willing, in the coming weeks, look at some of the incredible things he said, both good and bad. But our first reading this evening is in John's Gospel, chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 35. Again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas which is by interpretation a stone. Well, we trust that God will bless his word to us. Now shall we come before the Lord in prayer. 
Uh, Father and our God, we come to thee tonight, Father, and we praise and we worship thee. We know, Lord, it is good to praise thee. It is good to worship thee. We know, Father, there is a great host in heaven, an innumerable number of angels who worship and praise thee, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And Father, we, in our small way, in our small mind, in our limited understanding, would join them and understand that thou art a trice holy God, that you know everything, that you see everything, and Father, most of all, you see each one of our hearts here this evening. You know your people. Again, we think of Peter's own words. Lord, thou knowest all things. You know that I love you. And Father, you know that that is true of many here this evening. We pray for any father who are not saved. Lord, we understand that salvation is not of man, but it is truly of God. And we pray that by the power of your blessed spirit, you might move amongst us and yet save many. Again, we think of children, we think of grandchildren, and we think, Lord, of others, friends, people who we've known over years. We've been talking recently about all the work that's been done in this area over so many years. All the young ones who've heard the gospel, all the young men who have heard the word of God at football. Father, we pray for power into your word that you would yet save many. As we have received blessing in the past, so we might receive blessing in the future. And even in these days, all we worship thee, Father, we praise thee. We know that thou art an everlasting God. And yet, Lord, we are men and women. We are flesh. We have but a few years on this earth. But we pray, Father, that in that time, if it please thee, you will keep us that we might serve thee well. And that you would undertake for us every day in all our needs. Father, our needs are many. But we pray that you would be with us in all things. We pray again for our church that you would richly bless it. We pray that you would continue to uphold our pastor. We pray, Father, again for all our sick ones. There are so many of them, and we pray, Lord, undertake. We know, Lord, in an instant you can change their situation. Oh, Father, hear the prayers of your people, we pray thee. And, Lord, be amongst us this evening. We know, Lord, that the scripture is of no private interpretation. And therefore, Lord, we would be aware of that as we look into your word. Lord, open up to us the real truths of your word. May it bless our souls. May it encourage our souls. If need be, Father, may it rebuke us. But above all, Lord, we pray that you would indeed be amongst us. Hear us in now, our Father, we pray thee, for we ask it all in that glorious and victorious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Shall we sing our second hymn, hymn number 373? 373, Lord, I was blind, I could not see. <coughs>
like to look at our second reading, which is found in Luke's Gospel and Chapter 5. Luke's Gospel and Chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 1. And it came to pass, as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake, and they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And he was astonished. And all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which he had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth, Thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Well, we trust that God will indeed bless his word to us this evening. Now shall we sing our third hymn, hymn number 351, 351. Three, five, one, I hear thy welcome voice that calls me Lord to thee. And I come. Cleanse me by the blood that flows. 
Thank you for coming for the service this evening, being taken by our brother Steve Whitten. Uh, we look forward to what he's got to say to us. And because I keep forgetting this, after the meeting, there is a cup of tea and a cake or a sandwich outside for those who want to stay and have a bit of fellowship. So I've been forgetting all that business, so please do stay if you're able to. The meetings this week are as follows. On Tuesday at 7.45, or 8 o'clock even, is the Bible study which is quite a lively meeting, I believe, and uh, some younger people come who have plenty of questions to ask and keep the older people on their toes in giving some responses. On Wednesday, we have the Bible study, and uh, that starts at 7.45, definitely. And that's the prayer meeting, we'll follow that, but the prayer meeting is not transmitted on Facebook. Friday is the Children's Club, uh, which I think is about up to about age 11, is it? About 11, as they go over there, or they waver a bit on that. But anyway, last, yes, this Friday just gone, they had 38 youngsters, so it was great encouragement taking it out there, um, and hopefully there might be even more if our older people can cope running with these young people all over the park. So we look forward to that, and please pray for that meeting, because this is where the youngsters will get the gospel, we'll hear the truths of the scriptures, and indeed about our wonderful saviour, they may never hear it anywhere else. That's not boasting, that's just how life is, I'm afraid. Next Sunday morning at uh, 11 o'clock, we have uh, services here, and again at 6.30 in the evening. And um, I think that's the notices I've dealt with. Now, one or two things to add on, because there will always be with me something to add on. Uh, good uh, friend, Alan, who's our missionary uh, deacon, as in the notes, told us about a chap called Ron Cunningham, who, along with his wife Maria, we supported as missionaries for many years. They, they lived in Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm not sure how the attachment was, but Jack O'Gay was all that thing about Warren Street. They came to Warren Street in about 65 or sh ish. Who they knew, I think it was Mr. and Mrs. White, I don't know the details on that. Ron was a lovely man, uh, and his wife was, equally lovely. They would come and visit us from time to time, but they were in great demand always when they were over here on furlough because there were so many people who wanted to hear about the work that they were doing out in Ethiopia and after that Tanzania. Maria worked as a, a medical uh, lady. She helped in the ladies out there with children's births, and etc. Ron, Ron was an evangelist teacher and he talked a lot into schools out there and I believe he was greatly loved 
And the only reason they left Ethiopia, as far as I can remember, was the authorities didn't want them there anymore with the Christian gospel message because Ethiopia is basically a Muslim country and the, the locals rebelled against such teaching. So they left there, they came back home for a while, then they got an, a sign from the Lord to go to Tanzania and they spent many a, a good year out there. We did see Ron uh, once or twice, but as I say, he was often in great demand and the, his visits were fleeting. And the, to be honest, the, the pair of them, from what I can remember, they loved being out there doing God's work as missionaries. And even though they come over here to see people and their families, they couldn't wait to get back. Ron passed away. I don't know the exact details, and, and Alan, we only got a phone call about it, so we don't certainly know, know when he actually passed on to glory. But he's with the Lord. His wife is in a very sad way with Alzheimer's um, back home in Ireland, but they've got family out there looking after them there. So that's the story behind that. Uh, and the other thing is, again, mentioning Alan, he's, he, you must think he probably runs this place really now because he's seen that mentioned so many times. He's brought to our attention this book for Monica's benefit that we should all hopefully will put something in there about our good friend and brother Dave that will be a consolation in the years to come for Monica to look back and see all the things that people wrote with their adventures with him, uh, 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 stories, whatever. Mm -hmm. But please don't write Manchester United in there, okay? Because that, that's, you know, even I found it hard to say that. Okay, so um, I think that, that's about it. I can't think of anything else for a minute, but come next week, I might come up with some more stuff. So look forward to another chapter next week. Thank you very much. Over to you, Steve. Now, before our message, shall we sing together hymn number 538? What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. As I said, it is my intention, God willing, in the next few weeks or so, to look at the life of Peter, an incredible character. He was certainly the spokesman of the disciples. He seems to be, what we would say, one of the leading disciples, and he had many things to say. This is just a very, very brief outline of some of the things he said, which, God willing, we shall look at more closely over the coming weeks. First of all, Christ said, told him that he was a stone. Christ told Peter he was a stone, but that on his church, which was Christ, he was going to build his rock. Christ was going to build the church on himself, but Peter indeed was a stone. At one time, Peter rebuked Christ, and Christ had to say to Peter, 
Get thee behind me, Satan. When I was on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter again spoke up and he said, Lord, let me build three tabernacles here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And God had to say from the cloud, this is my beloved son, hear him. To show that Peter, I mean, we're going to look at other, more of this in depth, but to show that Peter certainly wasn't the first pope, and that the pope is nothing but basically a crook. Peter had a wife, which no pope has ever had a wife. Peter had a wife, and at one time his wife's mother was sick. Peter once said to Christ, when Christ was walking on the water, Peter said to Christ, Lord, if it's really you, let me come and walk on the water with you. And that he began to do. It was also Peter who said to Christ, explain to us the parable, explain what it meant. It was Peter who made the great confession. Thou art Christ, the son of the living God. Peter also said to Christ, I will die with you, I will die with you. He also said, even if all the other disciples forsake you, I will not. At one time, he followed Christ afar off. And as a result, he did go on to sin and to fall away. It was, it was Peter, again, who pointed out about the fig tree that Christ had cursed. On the way in, uh, Christ cursed the fig tree. On the way out, it was withered. And it was Peter who pointed out the fact that the fig tree had, had shriveled up. Someone asked Peter, does your master pay tax or tribute? It was Peter also who said to Christ, if my brother offends me, how many times should I forgive him? Should I forgive him seven times? And Christ said, no, you should forgive him 70 plus seven times. Peter also said to Christ, I have forsaken all and followed thee. Therefore, what shall I have? Of course, he denied Christ three times. And lastly, and I've got to say, this is not everything. This is just a brief outline. So, to, first of all, to show, Peter said an awful lot of stuff. Some of it was really good because he showed he was interested, and some of the stuff he'd done was really bad. But that's why he represents us, I believe. And, of course, he denied Christ three times. But then he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love thee. And as I say, over the coming weeks, God willing, we should look more closely at those various stories concerning Peter. But for tonight, I'd, I'd like to look at his call and, and, you know, what happened shortly after. Now, as you go through the Gospels, it's not always clear. And obviously, critics of the Bible, uh, they try and make out that this is a, a contradiction or, or they don't line up correctly well we know they do but sometimes it's difficult even for us if you read it but looking at the passage we read in John's gospel it would seem that his brother so Peter's brother Andrew him and John they were disciples of John the Baptist so get your head around that first of all John who was the son of Zebedee brother of James, and Andrew, they were disciples of John the Baptist. And it was them two who, when Christ walked by, John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. This is the man who I was talking about. And it was Andrew and John who then began to follow Christ. And we read it together. Christ turned around to them and he said, what seek ye? And they said to him, Master, where dwellest thou? And that must, that alone, what an incredible afternoon that must have been for them two young men. They spent the rest of the day with Christ. I say again, 
This was John, the one who wrote John's Gospel, and this was Andrew, who was Peter's brother. So that seems to be the first time uh, they met Christ. But then we know from other parts of the Gospels that Andrew went and told his brother Peter. He said, we have found the Christ, of whom it is written, we have found the Christ. And then Peter, he comes up to Christ, and Peter says to him, and Christ says to Peter, those famous words, thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Which of course, again, people have corrupted over the years, the Roman Catholic Church have tried to make out that Peter was the first Pope. Of course he wasn't. People actually worship the Pope. People believe that the Pope is sinless. Of course that is not true. There has only ever been one man who was sinless, and that was our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter himself, as we shall see this evening, he said to Christ, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And I would suggest that anybody, before they become a Christian, they have that understanding that they are sinful. It will vary on people. We're not all the same, there's no doubt about it. Conversions are not always the same. People sometimes take a long while to be converted. Some are converted instantly. But everybody, before they're converted, will come under a conviction of sin. Obviously, with Peter, it was a big conviction of sin. And, and we're going to see that in a minute. He, he falls down before him. But what I'd like to see is as well, who was Peter? Well, of course, we know. He was a fisherman. Now, I'm not going to try and be controversial right at the beginning, but I personally, and again, you may disagree with me, and you're welcome to come up and tell me other. I don't think Peter was a poor man. I'm not saying he was rich. He wasn't rich, but I don't believe he was a poor man. He was a tradesman. Fishing is a trade. It's still a trade today. In fact, if you look it up on the internet, fishing is a massive trade. Many countries fish. Some countries have a lot of water so that they can not only fish for their own land, they can sell fish. And in these days of refrigeration and deep freeze, fish can be kept for a long while. They're a wonderful food and they go out all over the world. And if you remember, you go back, I can't remember the exact year, we had a war with Iceland over who was going to fish whose water. And actually the Navy got involved. Fishing is very important. He goes right back to it. It was Peter. He was a fisherman. He had a ship. Now, we don't know exactly how big the ship was, but he had a fishing ship. He worked that ship again with his brother, Andrew. And he was partners in business with James and John, who also, it would seem, inherited their business from their father, Zebedee. Now, we know again, and of course you can look this up, I know you believe me anyway, but you can look it up if you want. Certainly Zebedee and James and John had hired servants. So they had hired servants. To be fair, it doesn't say that Simon had hired servants, but certainly Zebedee and his two sons they had hired servants. Because on one of the other accounts, it says that when, when James and John left their father, it says they left their father in the ship, with the hired servants. So the point I'm trying to make out, these four men were tradesmen. Their trade was fishing. And they were good at it. And to be good at something, you have to know all about it. Dare I say, <laughs> without getting emotional, I'm a tradesman myself. Uh, <laughs> my trade is foundry work. And of course, much more importantly, Christ was a tradesman. Christ was a carpenter. Now, I've already said this recently, but I need to say it again, because especially of our service yesterday, Mr. White was a lovely man. If I'm absolutely honest, I don't remember many of his sermons. But there was two things he did speak about, and in a sense, they was both to do with trades. He spoke about the blacksmith. And he used that as an example of the devil trying to beat us 
but God turning those beatings into making us into the shape that God wants us to be. You got the picture, there's a blacksmith, he puts the piece of iron in the forge, it comes out red hot, and then he beats it with a hammer, and he turns it, and in the end, the thing becomes a beautiful shape. The idea is that the devil, he wants to put us in the fire, he brings us out, he beats us, but really God is merely making us to the shape that he eventually wants us to be. That's what we call wrought iron. Forgive me for bringing uh, work into it. It's wrought iron. It, it's beaten out. It's shaped. And that was one of the descriptions what Mr. White gave, and I always remember that. Uh, that was a lovely description. But he also done a description about Christ, and I say, I've mentioned it recently, so forgive me for repeating. Christ was a carpenter. And what type of things would carpenters have made then? Obviously, they more than likely would have made chairs, maybe tables, maybe even uh, oars for rowing boats. But they would have made yokes for oxen because the yokes were made of wood. And again, I remember Mr. White saying, our favoured was that oxen that got the yoke that Christ made because it would have fitted exactly upon him. So even though he had the yoke on him and he had to work, Nevertheless, it would have been as less strenuous as possible because Christ had moulded it exactly to the shape of his body. Because Christ was a carpenter. He was a tradesman. And it's interesting, there's different trades in the Bible. Of course, Paul was a tent maker. We can mention other people. You go back to the Old Testament. Elisha. Elisha, when he was called, what was he doing? Elisha, when he was called, he was ploughing. He was actually ploughing with 12 yoke of oxen. You had to be strong to plough with 12 yoke of oxen. That's what Elijah was doing when he was called to follow God. The point is, all these men generally gave up their trades when they followed God. They gave them up. Peter, he forsook, he forsook his ship. He forsook his nets and he followed Christ. Going back to Elisha, he actually killed one of the oxen, cut up the wood that had been used for the oxen and he made a sacrifice to God and then eventually he went and followed Elijah. There's many trades in the Bible. We don't want to fill, make the office workers fill out of this because Matthew was a tax collector. He was a tax collector. There were scribes in the Bible. His name's just gone right out of my head, but there was that famous scribe in the, that Barak. Barak, the scribe, who wrote out all what Jeremiah had said. He wrote it all out, and then he gave it to the king, and the king cut it up, and he threw it on the fire. So there were men who didn't necessarily do manual work. They weren't necessarily tradesmen, but they were still very important. Everybody's job is important. And of course, the important thing is that we put effort into whatever we do. We talk to tradesmen today, they use the term a cowboy. You get someone to come around your house, you've got a problem, it might be a plumbing problem, it might be an electrical problem, and a guy who comes, he's not really an expert. And so when he goes away, all the fuses blow, or the water's still coming out of the tap, or whatever it be, and you say, oh, the guy was a cowboy. He wasn't a real tradesman. Real tradesmen are very precise about how they do their work. <laughs> I know some might think of me and smile when I say that, but a tradesman has great, what's the word I'm looking for? He has great pleasure in his work, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't want to give someone something that he wasn't happy with. He wouldn't, he wouldn't want to give someone something that he would, well, that ain't that good, I won't give him it. No. Now, I'm saying all this because this is what Peter was. He was a fisherman. He knew the sea. He knew the best place to put the nets. He knew the best time to fish. Indeed, as I say, he'd made a living out of it, along with his brother and along with his partners in business, James and John. So that's what Peter was. 
he was a tradesman, he was a fisherman. And this day, on the day of his call, now, I say again without repeating myself, he had already met Christ before this day. He had already met Christ, and Christ had already told him that his name would no longer be Simon, it would be Peter, and that he was a stone. He'd already, this conversation had already happened. But he had not yet had the call to evangelism and to follow Christ. This came about in Luke chapter 5, which we're going to look at a little bit now in more detail. Once again, we see Christ, and as always, he was out preaching. And people were pressing upon him. Many wanted to hear him. There was a great appetite. We know in other places in the scriptures it says that because he didn't teach like the scribes and the Pharisees. And in a sense, you even get that a bit today. You even get non-Christians say about, dare I say, Church of England vicars or whatever. You know, they, they waffle. They don't really say anything, they waffle. And so when someone hears someone, uh, they can understand it's, it's very beneficial. And this was how it was with Christ. These people have heard the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they'd heard them teaching and they always found it very dry, it was very unhelpful, it was religious, but it had no depth to it and it was boring. But when they heard Christ speak, they found it fantastic. It's true, they did follow him for the miracles, they followed him to be ill, they followed him to be fed, but they followed him because it was very interesting what Christ said. Christ actually open the scriptures and this is what we need to do we need to open the scriptures we need to look at the scriptures and say look this is what the bible is saying and this is what christ done of course because it was the word of god well anyway the people pressed upon him so much that as they kept moving and moving he was going further and further back and peter and his brother Andrew and James and John, they'd been out fishing all night. Their ships were by the side of the lake. They weren't in the ships anymore because they were cleaning their nets. They'd been fishing all night, so their nets more than likely had sand and muck from the bottom. And they felt, well, there's no point in fishing anymore today. We've been doing it all night. We ain't gonna catch anything. So we just leave our ships there. And that's what they've done. But then, as Christ comes along, he says to Peter, he, he says that he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and he prayed him, would you just thrust out a little from the land? And this was Christ's idea. He would take the boat a little bit out from the land, and that way he would preach from the ship or the boat. And so that's what happened. The ship goes out a little bit from the land so that the people can't walk in the water. Christ could then preach freely. He wasn't being pressed upon. And the people could still hear his wonderful words. Of course, all this, we know that Christ is sovereign. All this, it was planned by Christ anyway. He was going to, this was all about, <coughs> excuse me, this was all about the call of Peter. It wasn't so much about the other things that it was important, but he was going to show here Peter his power. And this is how it came about. So they take the sea out a bit, they take the boat out into the sea, a bit from the land, and he begins to preach from the boat. Then it says, and after he'd finished preaching, if you look at verse 4, now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Simon, launch out into the deep and let your net stand for a draught. So, in a, in a sense, this is almost the first instruction that he gives Peter. Take your boat out and put it in the deep. Now, as I said, they were, they'd already washed their nets and they, they washed their nets because they felt they wasn't going to do any more fishing today They'd probably been fishing all night because it does seem that that was the best time to fish. 
And they was more than likely tired because they'd been fishing all night. But he said, launch out and cast down your net for a drag. And Simon answered and said, Master, we have told all night and we have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So this is typical Peter and it's lovely. That's why we love him because he's so much like us. He questions what Christ says to him. He don't do it immediately. He said, look, master, we've told all night. Almost saying to Christ, look, I know these waters better than you. I'm a fisherman. I've been doing this all my life. I've told all night and I've not taken anything. But, but, nevertheless, because you asked me to do it, I'll do it. And in a sense, that's the attitude of Christians. Christ tells us to do things. And sometimes we find them difficult. He tells us to pray without ceasing and we say, well, Lord, we've done that and we doesn't seem to have got anywhere. But nevertheless, because you say that's what we should do, we will do it. So Peter there, a little bit hesitant, explains to Christ that he'd been fishing all night. But nevertheless, because Christ told him to do it, he would do it. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And so they let down the net. And it says that when they'd done it, they enclosed a great multitude of fish, so much so that the net break. Now, this is incredible. Again, we see the sovereignty of God. Christ knew exactly where every fish was. There were big fish, there were little fish, but Christ had put them all into that place so that those fish would all end up in Peter's net. It was a huge catch. You'll see how big it was because their net was breaking and they beckoned to their partners who were still on the beach. So James and John, their ship is still on the beach. They still got their nets there. They're still on the beach. Peter's out there now and he's got this massive amount of fish and he, shout, he beckons to him. He says, look, bring your ship out here. Bring your ship, we've got all these fish. So now the second ship goes out there. He goes out to meet, and we don't know, they more than likely wasn't far out, to be fair. And James and John go out there with their ship. And now there's so many fish, it says that they needed to, because both ships were full. And it came to pass, when they had filled both ships, that the ships then began to sink. There were so many fish that not only Peter's boat was sinking, but also now James and John's boat was sinking. The miracle in that alone is that the net itself didn't break. The net didn't break, even though there was enough fish in that net to sink two ships. Amazing. You can see the spiritual picture in it, of course, that when God decides to move, he moves and the net will not be broken. We often worry about people come, they go, and we think we might lose people. We will never lose God's elect. There's a responsibility on us to do all we can for people. That doesn't give a license not to care about people, not to love people, not to bend over backwards to keep people in our church in any way we can, but ultimately, no fish will be lost because the net will not be broken. The net that God has put out will always bring in his very elect. In fact, in another account we hear that they counted the fish and there was an exact number, 153. Well, the ships were sinking. They were both full. And this, we hear Simon's, one of his sayings, and it's lovely. It says that when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. It already met Christ. It already spoke to Christ. Christ had spoke to him. It wasn't just a miracle, because people see miracles every day. 
you know, we think of the birth of a baby, that's an absolute miracle. But as we've said before, springtime's a miracle. All the flowers look dead. When you go out in the garden in December, all the flowers are dead. In spring, they come back out with lovely colours in the flowers. That's a miracle. We see miracles every day. So it's not just a miracle. It's God, by his spirit, showing Peter what had happened. He was in the presence of no other than the Messiah. The one who had brought all these fishes into his net. And he falls down on his knees before Christ. And he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And as I said at the beginning, anyone who becomes a Christian will have this feeling at one time. Not in a sense that we'll want Christ to go, but we feel ashamed in his presence. We feel ashamed because of our sin. We're aware of our sin. And the longer you're a Christian, you're more aware of your sin. Don't think that you get to a stage where you feel, oh, no, I'm okay. No, no, no. You feel your sin every day. You feel the weight of it. You feel the burden of it. You realise, as Peter did here, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He fell on his knees. He asked that Christ would depart from him. But far from that, Christ was now going to call him. And it says also, so was James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They also, they were, they were astonished. And they, was amazing, they were partners. Now, one wonders, this great fish... Did the, did the money for it go to the family? Was it helpful to them in the next three years where they wouldn't have been getting any income at all? They would have relied on gifts. We know they had money because Ju Judas was in charge of it. Showing again, that's what Christ thought of money. Who did Christ put in charge of the money? Judas. It meant nothing to Christ. But nevertheless, there was this great catch of fish that was worth a lot of money. They were partners. They brought it to the land. And it says, and he says, Jesus says to Simon, after his great confession, depart from me for I am a sinful man. Christ says to him, Simon, fear not. Don't be afraid, Simon. From henceforth, thou shalt catch men. Up to now, you your brother and your two friends, you've been catching fish for all your life. We don't know how old they was. We always assumed the disciples was about early 20s. I guess they maybe was. But I would imagine since he was a boy, he'd worked with his father. All he'd ever known was fishing. We know from the rest of the scriptures, they was ignorant and unlearned men. These are the four men who Christ chose to spend the majority of his time with in the days of his ministry. For those three years, if you read through the other stories, it was Peter, James and John, and sometimes Andrew. Not always Andrew. Again, you might wonder why, that, why wasn't Andrew there? Especially as Andrew was actually called before Peter. It was Andrew who told his brother, but after Peter became, dare I say it, more important. Again, that's how God works. That is just how God works. But these four men who Christ chose to spend most of his time with in his ministry were just fishermen. I say just fishermen, I don't mean to belittle it. As I've said already, they were great tradesmen. They knew their trade, they knew all about fishing. But when they saw what Christ done, they were absolutely amazed. And Christ said, look, from now on, you are not going to fish fish anymore you're going to fish men you're going to go out and you're going to be bring in a great catch and of course this happened certainly in the days to come they would see many people saved we go back to Pentecost as they preached many people were saved they saw not only Jewish people saved they saw Gentile people saved but the net was never broken Everyone who God intended to bring into his kingdom came in. It was incredible. And notice what it says. It says, they forsook 
all and they followed him. There wasn't no thinking about it. He said, I'm going to make you fishes of men. You need to follow me. And that is what they done. They left their... James and John, as I said, it says they left their father with the eyed servants, whether Peter uh, and his brother, and whether they had um, eyed servants or they just left it to the servants of James and John, we don't know. God doesn't tell us that, but what he does tell us is that they forsook all and they followed him. Remember again that Peter had a wife and it, he would have left her to a degree. Obviously, as they went around preaching, maybe his wife went with him, maybe he went home sometimes. Again, we don't know the detail. But the call of Christ is to everyone, forsake all and follow me. We need to follow Christ. We need to become fishers of men. Well, by God's grace, may we be those who are concerned for others. May we help to lay down the net of salvation that others may come into the kingdom. And by God's grace, in the weeks ahead, may we see more about this incredible chap, Simon Peter, an incredible man, an ignorant and unlearned man who asked so many good questions, who said some very foolish things, but was incredibly loved of Christ. Amen. And shall we close our meeting by singing hymn number 665, Sweet is the work, my God, my King. Father, once again, we thank you for your blessed word. Lord, what a blessing it is to our soul. Father, we thank you for these wonderful characters. We thank you that we see ourselves in them for their failings and for their shortcomings. Oh, Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We pray, Lord, that we might love him the more, that we might know him the better. Be with us now, Father, as we fellowship together. Be with us throughout this coming week, for we ask it all in that glorious and victorious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.